Dr. Leslie Davis Burns is president and founder of Responsible Global Fashion, LLC, and Professor Emeretta of Apparel Design and Merchandising at Oregon State University. She is the author of Sustainability and Social Change in Fashion, co-author of The Business of Fashion, and editor-in-chief of the new online resource, Bloomsbury Fashion Business Cases. In this interview, I talk to Leslie about sustainability in the fashion and design industry right now, and she breaks down some of the key concepts and ideas on the topic. We also take a look at what different organizations and retailers are doing to be more sustainable and inclusive, and discuss how we can all work to reduce the negative impact the fashion industry has on our environment. Take a listen. Welcome to the Bloomsbury Academic Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Morofsky, and today I'm here with Leslie Davis Burns, the author of Sustainability and Social Change in Fashion. Welcome, Leslie. Thanks for being on the show. Um, so just to begin, what's your background in fashion and what interested you in writing a book about sustainability? Um, I started um, sewing my own clothing when I was probably about 10. Um, in high school, I started designing my own clothes. Um, and I took specialized training at that time, learning tailoring techniques. And what I learned later on were couture techniques for sewing. And so um, when I went on to the university, I majored in apparel design and merchandising. Um, it was a love that I had had for a long time. Um, when I was at the university, I first thought that I would uh, go into fashion retailing. But I learned in college that I really enjoyed social science research. So I eventually earned my PhD in consumer sciences and retailing and started teaching and conducting research as a university professor in apparel design and merchandising. Um, and I was teaching fashion forecasting, uh, retail merchandising, um, some consumer behavior courses um, at the time. This was in the early 1980s, okay, so the fashion industry, yeah, so I've been around for a long time, so the fashion industry was very different than it is now. Um, it was changing dramatically at the time. Um, there was uh, really the beginnings of global expansion. Uh, technologies were changing. Uh, we were introducing something called computer-aided design. Uh, there was production strategies changing, retailing was changing, we were having store brands and uh, fast fashion was first coming on the scene. Um, and we were teaching about how do you do things faster, better, quicker, cheaper, and selling them to the consumer in ways that they would buy more and more and more. And in the early, well, really early mid 1990s, there were a couple of high profile scandals that that caught not only my attention, but the attention of the world. Um, so the Kathy Lee Gifford sweatshop scandal. She was a TV personality at the time. She had a line of clothing for Walmart that was found to be made in Central American sweatshops. And there were articles, uh, particularly in the New York Times, about environmentally unsafe working conditions in um, Nike factories. There were then more news reports about sweatshop conditions, um, environmental impact of textile production. Uh, there were uh, chapters of the United Students Against Sweatshops that popped up on many campuses, uh, looking at licensed, university licensed uh, merchandise. Um, and I was part of those conversations um, at my university as well. And I really did some soul searching at this time. Um, I was became uncomfortable about teaching strategies and practices that I knew were contributing to the depletion of human and natural resources. And I got to thinking, what can I do? What, what can I do to create a better tomorrow for the fashion industry? And it dawned on me, well, of course, my students, they are the corporate decision makers of the future. They're the ones that as a faculty member that I can influence and instill um, strategies and practices that they, they could take into their, their own companies as they went out into the workforce. Um, 
And so I started teaching my courses using a corporate social responsibility paradigm. I also knew I needed to learn more. And so I met with industry leaders. I started visiting factories, both good factories and not so good factories. Um, I became really interested in social compliance programs. And so I completed um, the lead auditor training course that was offered by the Worldwide Responsible Accredited Production Organization. I became a accredited um, factory auditor. Um, I didn't actually do that, but I, it definitely informed my teaching. Um, I started attending the ethical sourcing forums that were in New York City, and I started reading everything that I could about strategies that the companies were using. I, as a scholar, I was conducting research on consumer decision making. Um, I did some research on supply chain transparency and environmental uh, analyses of textiles. By about 2010, I would say, um, there was a large body of literature on various aspects of fashion sustainability. But the research, articles, books, business practices in general were pretty fragmented. Um, and what I believed was needed was a framework that both described as well as integrated in a meaningful way the strategies that fashion brand companies were implementing. And, and that led me to writing this book. Um, it provides that framework uh, and the book is organized around six principles for creating sustainable supply chains. We throw around the word sustainability a lot. It's a very popular buzzword right now, yeah. but um, if you wouldn't mind, what is your definition of fashion sustainability and what does a sustainable supply chain look like to you? Yeah, I, you know, very simply, um, to me, a sustainable supply chain in fashion is one that be, can be economically sustained over time without depleting either human or natural resources. So fashion brand companies use a combination, a whole variety of um, very interrelated strategies um, to advance. And I view sustainability in four ways, economic, environmental, social, and cultural. And what does that look like in the in the realm of fast fashion versus slow fashion? And for people who don't know what those terms mean, could you also expound sure. upon? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, let's compare fast fashion and and slow fashion um, and what those mean in terms of fashion sustainability. Uh, fast fashions are trendy fashions. Uh, they're designed to be manufactured using a, a short cycle supply chain calendar. Um, that means that they go from um, concept to consumer in a matter of weeks rather than a traditional supply chain calendar, which can take months. Um, examples are Zara and H&M. Um, mm -hmm. The fashion products are meant to be sold quickly. They generally don't have replenishment at the retail level. Uh, consumers purchase products frequently. They expect to wear them only a short period of time. And so they're typically not designed or manufactured for any type of longevity of use. Slow fashion, on the other hand, um, is a movement within the fashion industry to deaccelerate this fashion process. Um, it's really patterned after the slow, move, slow food movement. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a general philosophy and it's, I view it as a, as a continuum. So we've got um, the purists, um, in terms of slow fashion that are using small scale and traditional production techniques, they're sourcing their materials and even production locally. They're advancing all you know, environmental, social, and cultural sustainability. They're, many of them create heirlooms or other kinds of products that, that consumers have a connection to. And they use both production um, design and production techniques that are designed around high quality, um, long lasting, adorable um, fashions. The companies that use this purist approach um, typically are pretty small scale. And so 
and there's challenges, particularly around sourcing materials and production locally that's not always available to companies. So many companies have taken on aspects of slow fashion uh, that are designed around extending the life of the fashion products. So they may be doing fewer lines, they may do, be doing trans-seasonal lines, lines that cross seasons, they may be focusing on classic styles, um, mm. they may focus on high quality materials, construction, using environmentally sustainable materials. Some of them are, are doing um, adaptable designs where you can adapt clothing for size or age. Um, some are focusing on services to extend the life of products and uh, they'll mend the products um, for people or they'll teach consumers how to mend products. So all of these are around um, really slowing down the fashion process and extending the life of the product. Um, are there any major companies? I mean, I know you said that it's it can be quite small scale at this point, but are there any major companies that are have impressed you with their slow fashion strategy? Yeah, yeah. One of the, that comes to mind is Alabama Channon. Um, this is a a company that is really doing heirloom quality products, um, and they have um, and and local sourcing. Um, they're not necessarily getting all of their materials locally, but they're doing production locally um, in Alabama. And they also have a whole variety of, of opportunities for consumers um, from buying the heirloom products to visiting and, and learning how to sew, to buying books, to buying kits. Um, so a whole way of, of really engaging the consumer in their community of, of the products as well as as the connection to to the products you know as personally speaking i'm trying very hard to embrace more slow fashion practices uh because i'm starting to think about my own personal impact but i can't get a straight answer on everlane um because you know on the one hand i hear a lot of things about it having a very sustainable like strategy but then i hear some things that kind of contradict that as a fashion expert could you give me an answer about Everlane? Sure, sure. so Everlane is is well known for their transparency um, mm -hmm. and and for their trans seasonal lines so they're as a direct consumer um, uh, company they're not putting out you know five lines a year um, their um, their clothes have a real classic styling um, they have fewer lines and I mean, they're basically, okay, we're, we were going to start with one product and then we're going to add products that we know that we can be traceable and transparent about their production. So they have, so that's their, has been their focus. Um, when you look at a product, you can get um, information about not only where it's made, but you can get pricing transparency information. This is what it costs for us to, this is what the zipper costs. This is what the buttons cost. Um, and that's something that, that's unusual um, in that, that type, that level of transparency. Um, so companies have different focuses um, depending upon what strategies they have tr decided to embrace and to move forward with. Um, some have criticized it as well. These aren't so-called trendy fashions. Well, no, they're classics. They're um, they're going to be made in um, more neutral colors um, because they are. That's their strategy of extending the life of the of the products. I really need to get off of their email list. It's kind of dangerous for <laughs> me personally, um, <laughs> and I am personally uh, sold on their transparency practices. But um, something that you also mentioned was that you said the slow fashion movement is based uh, or has based its strategy kind of on the slow food movement. Um, I think that there's a lot of consciousness about how factory farms and eating meat contributes to climate change. But I think that we're only just starting to talk about how fast fashion contributes to climate change, uh, can you talk about the scope 
of the environmental impact that flash fashion has on the planet? Yeah. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of background. I'll throw out a few statistics, but I think it's important for for people to understand what the current state of the industry is um, and that it's that our current fashion industry is not sustainable. Um, overconsumption and the traditional practices um, continue to exhaust both natural and human resources. And there's a huge body of literature on this. Um, the current fashion system is almost entirely linear, which is what we refer to as you buy, you use, and you throw away. Um, it uses large amounts of non-renewable resources. Um, there's manufacturing, of course, overproduction of clothing that people don't need um, that will be worn only a few times, often in factories that are unsafe and unhealthy. And then the, the products are simply discarded as textile waste. Um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has been conducting a, a lot of research on, on uh, textile waste and and that fashion sustainability. Um, and just a few statistics, in the last 15 years, clothing production has approximately doubled. While during that same time, the average number of times garments are worn before they are no longer used has decreased by 36%. Less than 1% of materials used to produce clothing is recycled into new clothing. And of the total fiber input used for clothing, so the resources used for clothing, 87% is eventually landfilled or incinerated. And one statistic that just, just jumped out at me is one garbage truck of textiles is landfilled or incinerated every second. Oh my gosh. So consumers assume it's okay. They give their used clothing to a thrift store. So they wear it a few times. It's ready to fall apart. So they donate it. And although the numbers vary, even the best estimates are that only about 20% of donated clothing actually ends up in the secondhand market. Um, a lot of it is simply unwearable. It's, it's worn out, okay, after just a couple of wearings. And so it can't be sold again, um, or it's stained, or there isn't a market for it. And so um, it, yeah, there's, it, we could do a whole nother podcast on, on textile waste, but um, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Now, fast fashion, while they're not the only culprits, um, obviously has exacerbated this unsustainable system. Uh, consumers used to buying uh, very inexpensive, um, trendy clothing that, and they can buy lots of it. And it was the expectation that it's, it's a throwaway type of resource. That's the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> What's the good news? <laughs> There's really a lot of, of wonderful things happening. Um, the, the, there are companies that are taking on this challenge um, uh, and incorporating lots of different strategies uh, to, to take on the challenge. I mean, you said that you started in the 80s and that it was a really different world in fashion back then. But do you feel now that sustainable fashion is lifting off, that it can radically change the fashion world? Or do you feel like the fast fashion industry is going to do everything it can to undermine this movement? Are you hopeful? I, I actually am very hopeful. Um, I think there has um, obviously been increased interest um, with regards to um, both, both in terms of the fashion industry, but also uh, of consumers in terms of wanting to make a difference. Um, there are lots of, of, well, from the consumer point of view, for example, um, there are companies who are focusing on educating consumers around buying fewer um, products, about um, looking at higher quality clothing items that you love will last over time. Um, there are obviously companies that are taking on the issue from a variety of perspectives, whether it is conducting research and promoting sustainable materials, promoting longevity of use, um, transparency of um, production and design, 
um, creating sustainable, enhancing uh, sustainable communities, um, and looking at all aspects of logistics from packaging to transportation and the environmental impact of, of retail. And do you feel like, I mean, because I think one criticism of this movement right now is that it still feels pretty niche in the sense that only a certain class of people can afford um, some of these, some of this clothing, you know, from companies like Everlane, for instance. Uh, do you feel, do you feel like the ethical fashion industry is working to become more accessible and inclusive? And if so, how? Yeah, I personally don't think it's a luxury niche. Um, I, I, but I hear from consumers, they want to be more sustainable, but it's just, you know, quote unquote, too expensive. And the challenge is that consumers don't view their clothing as a valued resource. They're used to wearing it, throwing it away. Um, and so they need, this is, and this is going to be a, this is the real challenge of changing consumer, consumer mindsets in terms of buying fewer, higher quality clothing items, not necessarily buying new. There are lots of options other than buying new products. Um, the secondhand market is both thrift stores as well as on, you know, online apps are growing in um, just numbers as well as, as the uh, types of clothing that and accessories that are being sold. Um, and so it, there's, again, there's opportunities to um, look at ways to mend fashions, to extend their life. Um, Fashion Revolution, which is an industry organization, has, has a ton of resources for consumers um, on how to become more sustainable and become more sustain sustainable on a budget. Um, and so I think there's, real opportunities for engaging consumers and in countering this this notion that that textiles are not valued and and they're they're a throwaway resource um inclusivity has has come a long way as well um and i'll just view inclusivity a little bit more broadly than just um, being able to afford it um, we see size inclusive, ability inclusive, uh, gender inclusive fashions, um, as well as those that um, are much more affordable. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's definitely come a long way, and and I see uh, consumers, particularly uh, younger consumers, uh, really engaging with this and and thinking about about clothing in a very different way than even five, 10 years ago. I mean, along those lines, um, as a professor, do you feel with your, what has your experience been with your own students and their ideas about sustainability? Because oh, obviously. Absolutely. Um, students um, have definitely become more interested in this over the years. Um, and in fact, I think students are probably pushing apparel design, fashion design, fashion programs around the world to include more courses and projects um, that, that focus on sustainability. Um, I know a lot of, of programs have and are now including zero waste design projects, upcycling, partnering with, with organizations to do upcycling projects and design, um, looking at packaging and projects that, that focus on, on packaging and hang tags and um, transportation. Um, I'm part of, I, I'm involved with Bloomsbury Fashion Business Cases. There are a ton of case studies on sustainable practices, everything from design through production to retailing practices. And so I think there definitely is um, greater interest in it, it, the university, college and university level about incorporating uh, sustainability aspects throughout their coursework. Um, I oftentimes get questions from students. Well, you know, do you think that do you think it's going to 
you know, fast fashion will go away. <laughs> and, you know, I, um, I remember I used to say, would teach about counterfeits. And I would ask the students, do you think counterfeits will go away? And the answer was, well, of course not. As long as there are mar there's a market, you're still going to have counterfeits. And I, and I guess I would say the same thing about fast fashion. You think fast fashion is going to go away? No. Um, as long as there is a market for, for, for inexpensive, low quality clothing, then um, there's, going, you know, there's going to be fast fashion. Um, I heard a statistic, and I don't know where this where it came from a, a couple of weeks ago that that fashion consumption has actually gone down, and I don't remember the exact percentage. And I was thinking that's a really great great thing because um, that means that people are thinking more about okay, I'm not going to buy as much, and I'm going to buy higher quality, and and hopefully. Um, clothing that that I can extend the life of or that the life is being extended in some way. Yeah, that's something personally that I've been thinking about for the last year or two, really. It's it's a sort of new evolution for me. And maybe it's uh, also, you know, having an income for the first time in my life. But, <laughs> but I, with that came a sort of responsibility of uh, how do I become an ethical consumer? But uh, along the lines of the demand for fast fashion, I was wondering if you could tell me what the environmental impact of buying fast fashion brands in a secondhand clothing store is, if, if that, yeah, I don't know, is it eliminating the issue with supporting those brands or is it still an, is it still a problem to buy them from secondhand stores? Well, you know, the secondhand market is um, way, way, one way of extending the life of, of the, of the products um, and extending the life of the products in a way that is value. So it still could be worn as, as apparel. Um, a lot of the textile waste is really downcycled where um, it is used for rags or it is chopped up or it may even be incinerated. So um, the secondhand market is, is one way, it's not the only way, but it is one way of extending um, the life of those of garments in a way that that um, at, that is valued, um, and I think this is the the key aspect is that these are resources um, that should be valued. Uh, they have both natural resources and human resources that have gone into them, and so how can we extend the value of that resource for a longer period of time? Uh, and the second hand market is is one way of doing that. And I mean, there's more ways of, of I mean, there's upcycling. You can take, um, there's a number of companies that are doing amazing work with, uh, with taking scrap material and, and upcycling it. Um, there's, there's companies that are um, taking textile waste right from the factories and um, upcycling it in, in interesting ways. So both what we call pre-consumer waste and, and post-consumer waste are, are being used. And, and so there are lots of strategies in terms of extending the value and the um, uh, usefulness of those, of those textile resources. Do you have a couple of examples of companies that are, are doing a lot of upcycling? Yeah, um, a couple of examples. Um, one of my favorite companies is Tondle. T O N L E. Um, they're out of Cambodia, and they use pre-consumer textile waste. Um, they get uh, leftover fabrics from the apparel uh, factories in the Cambodia area, um, and use those leftover um, textiles that would otherwise be thrown away, and they make apparel out of them, they will, they make yarns, they do some, um, they even take their textile waste um, and they will make um, paper out of it. So they're doing, making some cotton paper so that, that it's truly a zero waste um, process of utilizing all the, all the, the um, resources in a way that's adding value to them. Um, there's Sansusi, uh, which is a company out of, um, 
well, she was out of Vancouver. She's now moved, but she was, she takes leftover uh, pantyhose, okay, and, and hosiery from mills and um, creates new fabric from those. These would have been hosiery that would have been um, probably put into landfill uh, and creates new fabrics out of them. Um, on the post-consumer uh, research, post-consumer textile wayside uh, company out of Portland, which is called Looped Works, that upcycles um, all kinds of leftover merchant products and, and materials. Um, they've partnered with airlines and taken the leftover um, uh, when they've remodeled airplanes and there's leather left over from the seats, they upcycle it. They've worked with the NBA in taking left the, the jerseys that would have been thrown away and upcycled those. Um, so they do a whole variety of products um, using upcycled, um, upcycling textile waste materials. So with these uh, sustainable fashion companies, um, they're obviously they're obviously um, emphasizing environmental practices. But are mm -hmm. there other kinds of social objectives objectives that they're making a priority in their business practice? Yeah, there's well, there's a number of companies that kind of take a holistic view. Then the ones that I just mentioned were really focusing on upcycling. Obviously, there are also wanting to do um, uh, social sustainability and enhancing social sustainability. Totally, for example, um, works with a number of uh, um, women's empowerment groups and, and really providing um, living wages and, and other aspects of the, in terms of the production in, in Cambodia. Um, other companies that, that take a much more holistic perspective, of course, Eileen Fisher is one that comes to mind um, that looks at, has, has been involved with not only environmental sustainability, but um, looking at trying to do a more circular, uh, where they collect um, products that, that are no longer worn and re upcycling them in ways that, um, so that, that those resources can be used. They have um, a number of, of social sustainability and social compliance aspects to their their work. So, you know, really kind of holistic perspective. Patagonia does this as well. Um, there's a company, Indigenous Designs, that um, has a, kind of an interesting supply chain, and they work with with co-ops in Peru um, using organic cotton and really providing. Um, no interest loans to these co-ops, management skills. So again, building economic and social sustainability while making very environmentally and socially responsible products. An interesting company I'll just, I'll just mention is um, the Renewal Workshop, um, which has partnered with a number of brands of taking merchandise that the brands would have thrown away. So this would be maybe returned or a button is missing, or the zipper broke. They're, they don't know what to do this, this. And the renewal workshop renews it. They sew on that button. They fix the zipper. And they sell, then they sell the product um, as a renewed. It's, it's, uh, they're typically you know, much, much less than what the, um, uh, the, the garment would have sold for originally. Um, and it has a little tag that it's renewed. It tells you what they did to it. Um, so that's kind of an interesting model, again, of, of extending the life um, of, the, of the product. And also at a, at a price point that, um, that really anyone can, can afford. Honestly, it's so amazing. It's really exciting to hear you talk about all these companies that are doing this. I mean, it makes me hopeful too, actually, that this is becoming more of a norm than some kind of uh, niche market. So where do you see this practice going in five years? What do you think the fashion world is going to look like? 
Well, I think there's um, three things that are um, going to be the key aspects for the next five years and, and beyond. Um, and those three aspects are traceability, transparency, and circularity. Uh, I think that companies are going to be expected to know where they're, there's already laws around this, but they're pretty general laws um, focusing on, on alleviate, trying to alleviate human trafficking. Um, but the traceability and transparency of the supply chains um, of companies being expected to not only know where their suppliers are, who their suppliers are, but communicating their full supply chain from raw materials um, to retail and everything in between. As a consumer, I know I want to know, so what are the materials? How is it being made? Where are the products made? And I want evidence. I, I, want, I want to see images. I want to see videos. I, I want to see what the impact, um, if they're claiming sustainability um, around their products, I want to see impact statements. Um, so what really is happening? With regards to circularity, um, I think this is becoming more and more important of uh, valuing and really instilling in, in consumers um, the importance of these textile resources as, as valued resources and keeping them for as long as possible. Um, with regards to consumers, um, I think there's the importance, well, Fashion Revolution has, has, I think I've mentioned, has wonderful resources for consumers. One of my favorite um, charts that they have, or yeah, little charts, is a decision tree um, for consumers. And it starts with the question, do you need to buy it new? Um, can you use what you have? Do you, can you repair something or renew something that you already have? Maybe you just can borrow, borrow it. Um, or maybe you can rent it. Um, but do you really need to buy it new? Um, if you don't need to buy it new, can you, re you know, if you will, has it renewed clothing or second mar secondhand market through a thrift store or resale app? Um, and if you need to buy it new, then look for fashions that you love, that you, that are made to last, that can be worn over a long period of time. Um, and so I think that between the companies really focusing on traceability and transparency and circularity and consumers ex both expecting that, but then also rethinking their own consumption practices, um, I'm very hopeful all, over the next five years and beyond. I hope you know that after this conversation, I'm going to consult the fashion tree. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I, I think that's incredible. Um, I mean, I guess on a on a final note, like you've you've touched upon this a lot about can the action and the decision making being in the hands of consumers. Quite a bit of it. I mean, how do you think other than supporting some of these more sustainable brands, how can consumers promote a more eco-friendly fashion industry? How can we drive towards this vision that you have? I think it's it's really having to rethink consumption practices. And this is tough. Um, this is this we have been so you know with the, re, the, it, the well the fashion industry has just provided us with this inexpensive clothing um, that really has created this mindset of it you can just just wear and throw away. And I think understanding the impact of that on both human and natural resources is really opens up people's eyes to, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And I think that's where when you think about consumption and and the the value that textile resources 
have. Um, you know, this really is has been something that's happened over the last, really the last generation. Um, you know, you look at at if if anyone it lives in a a house or an apartment that was built before about 1950, you know what the closet looks like. It's about two feet, okay? And that's all you needed because you had, that's all you had clothing, that's all the clothing you, you had. And that's all the clothing you, you needed. And now, I mean, over the years, of course, you know, the closets have gotten bigger and bigger, 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 bigger. Um, and so this mindset of having so much is really something, do you really need it? Do you really, and if, and you, if you want something new, do you really need to buy new? I think that's, those are, are um, the, the primary, the two basic questions that consumers can ask. It's hard. Um, I remember talking with a student, um, a college student, not oh, probably a month ago, a month and a half ago, and she's like, I don't know if I can do that. I mean, I'm telling her the same thing. I said, I don't know if I can do that. And so it is. It's a real difficult um, change of philosophy of when we were bombarded um, and have been bombarded for years of having these huge wardrobes. Right. I mean, it's not just fashion. It's fighting against an entire consumer culture, especially in the United States. I mean, with the rise of advertising since the 60s, I think that we've been driving towards more and more and more in all aspects of our lives. So I don't I don't think it's just fashion that we have to realign our priorities with. I think we just have to completely, as you said, completely change the paradigm about how we think about consumption on a grand on a totally uh, grand scheme level. But that's um, all we have time for in, in the interview. But I just wanted to say uh, thank you um, just for everybody. It's I'm here with Leslie Davis Burns. She's the author of Sustainability and Social Change in Fashion, and you can find her book on Bloomsbury's website. Um, so yeah, thanks for talking, Leslie. You're very, very welcome. Thanks so much.